Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guests today are Gary Orfield and Patricia Gandara. Orfield is Professor of Education, Law, Political Science, and Urban Planning, as well as a co-director of the Civil Rights Project at UCLA. Orfield, the 2015 Wayne Morse Chair, researches social policy with a focus on the impact of policy on equal op opportunity. In addition to his scholarly work, Orfield has also taken an active role in affirmative action and civil rights cases. Gandara is a professor in the Graduate School of Education and Information Sciences, as well as co-director of the Civil Rights Project at UCLA. Gandara has been a director of education research in the California State Legislature and served as California's commissioner for post-secondary education. Gandara, the Morse Center's 2015 visiting distinguished researcher in education, writes extensively about educational equity for racial and linguistic minority students, school reform, access to higher education, the education of Latino students, and language policy. Orfield and Gandara gave a lecture titled Diversity in Higher Education, Dangers of a Colorblind Society on October 6, 2015, as part of the Wayne Morse Center's 2015 17 theme, The Future of Public Education. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you for the invitation. Good to be with you. The two of you co-direct the Civil Rights Project at UCLA. Tell us about the origins of the project and its goals. Well, the project started in 1996 at Harvard University. Uh, I started it with a colleague, Christopher Edley, who later became Dean of Law at Berkeley. Uh, our idea was to create a new generation of research on issues of civil rights and equal opportunity in American society and to bridge the gap between law and social research in a much more powerful way than had been done before by getting the best researchers in the country to address the most pressing questions of civil rights. And have, have the goals evolved over time? Well, the issues have evolved, of course, and the challenges have deepened in some ways, and we've produced more than 500 studies and about 20 books and been involved in a number of Supreme Court cases, including one that's coming up in a couple of months um, where we've just finished a brief. Uh, we've been involved in many ways across the country the last 19 years, and we are also extending our work internationally, working in Mexico, holding a conference in Europe with researchers on school segregation and immigration from across th that continent. So it is interesting that the, uh, a major impetus for the founding of the Civil Rights Project was what happened in California in 1996, the banning of affirmative action. And so bringing the Civil Rights Project back around to the West Coast has, there's a certain symmetry to all of this. Mm. And, uh, and it has expanded in the area of some of the issues that are foremost uh, in the West, such as the segregation of Latino students and the tremendous growth in this population in the West. So s explain why um, diversity is so important in educational context, both in the K through 12 and in higher education. Why is that a good thing? Why is that a good thing? Why is that something that we should advocate for and try to achieve? Well, there's a couple of central reasons. One is that wherever you have segregation, um, you have inequality. It would be fine if you had two groups that had equal power, resources, and, and uh, parent background and everything, it wouldn't matter very much. But it matters tremendously. And since education is the only opportunity we offer to overcome the tremendous built-in economic and social inequality of the society, uh, making it work is vital. Now, in terms of benefits for everybody, um, when you're in a diverse class where you have students from different backgrounds and different perspectives, um, different understandings of the world, it jogs your, your, your thinking process. It makes you begin to think through other people's eyes, develop some more empathy and understanding. And that enriches your capacity to understand and to work in a different kind of setting. And all of Americans are going to have to live in a society where there is no racial majority. That's already true in the West. It's been true for a number of years now, and it's going to become more so every year. As a psychologist by training, I always think about these things, too, from a psychological perspective, mm -hmm. in, in addition to the political and public policy perspective. And we've known for some time 
that um, diversity of experience, diversity of contact with, uh, with difference is in fact cognitively enriching. And there's good reason to believe, and I'm sure once we get to that point, there's going to be some really good research in this area that shows uh, that this actually makes people smarter. Mm. Are there particular benefits or um, prompts for the diversification of the academy of higher education? What's why is that? It, why is that's I know th that's a particular challenge, and mm. what are the particular? challenges but also benefits of diversifying the academy. It is so important because basically our history and most of our literature has been written from perspective of one racial and one class group. Uh, and we're not that kind of a country and we really never have been. Um, one of the articles in a book that we submitted to the Supreme Court the last time there was an affirmative action struggle uh, was by a, a history, Southern history professor from the University of Virginia. And he describes what it was like uh, when he no longer taught his Southern history class to an all-white group of graduate students. He said as soon as there were African-American students in the class, it was essential and it always happened that issues that would be talked about about Southern history that had never been talked to before. Uh, so that everybody had to think about things that nobody was thinking about. And um, there was that kind of encounter. And since the whole history of the South built on the original sin of slavery, it's very, very absurd when you think about it for so long in a great university to have seminars that didn't have anybody who actually understood the other half of the story. I'll add to that a, a very contemporary and economic perspective. Mm -hmm. There is a reality that, um, for example, uh, both Latino and African Americans are much less likely to go to the university and to get degrees. It is especially true for Latinos, appallingly so. Mm -hmm. Give us briefly the statistics, because I've heard you mention them before. Tell oh, sure, yeah. Um, if we go across the groups, Asian Americans, about 60% of the college age population is getting a degree. Among uh, white students, it's upwards of 40%. There's even a gap there. With African Americans, it's about 20%. And with Latinos, we have been crawling up at a rate somewhere between 13 and 14%. And what's the Latino population of the United States as a percentage? As a percentage, it's about one in five right now. But let me tell you about places in the West. Here in Oregon, you are quickly arriving at one in four. I think it's somewhere between 22 and 23%. In California, it is now 54% of the students in our schools. So people have been attending to this problem. If we don't get these students into college and with college degrees, we have a huge economic problem on our hands. California is currently projected, with its huge population of Latinos, currently projected to be over one million BA degrees short of meeting its labor force needs by 2025. Well, in terms of getting the faculty diverse, you know, research expands when you get diverse faculties. There are things that nobody thought that was, were that important, that suddenly there's somebody who knows how important they are. Um, and those, that enriches everybody's knowledge. Also, faculty of color um, are very important signals to students of color, that this is a possible life for them. And these are people who are more likely to be mentors that will help make sure that they get there if they, if they decide to commit themselves. That's to really true, but Gary, I, I think you, know, you can't say it strongly enough yes. that it changes the research agenda. Mm -hmm. yes. And when you don't have those faculty there in the university, it's a different research agenda. And one that you know, can be narrow to the point of really Harm, being harmful. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why there's this struggle to diversify faculty because people see the things that young fa scholars of color are working on and they're not on the existing agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that means it's hard to explain it to people who've lived within that agenda. Um, and that's why it's so important to have those fights because the issues that they bring are ex expanding everybody's possibilities. Now, none of that's to say that a, 
a white faculty member and an Asian faculty member can't be a good mentor for students of color, for example, or be interested in those subjects. And my life has all been about that. But um, it just enriches the, the intellectual structure and improves the relationship possibilities uh, in, the, in the great professions that shape our country. Can you talk a little bit more historically about, you mentioned the, the, uh, the rollback of affirmative action in California. So let's just go back a little bit historically. Let's talk about the positive impacts of affirmative action in the United States over the past 50 years. What, why, is a, why, why is affirmative action a good thing? Where has it worked? What has it done that's been all, good? All us? of the elite colleges in the United States up until the mid-60s were segregated. There were virtually no black or Latino students uh, in those colleges, even in the undergraduate sections. Americans can't really understand how isolated it was. It was only because of the civil rights movement that all, almost every highly selective college decided to become integrated. Um, and so we went from a situation that had been always true of American history until then to a situation where almost all of our e elite colleges that train our national leaders and our state leaders uh, became more diverse. Uh, and that just was a tremendously important development. And it didn't happen without colleges deciding that they needed to do it, without government deciding that it needed to be supported, and without faculty members fighting for it on many campuses and students protesting. It, took, it was a part of a big change. And it, given the fact that in this generation, almost all the gains and opportunities, the rich opportunities, are connected to higher education, and almost all our leaders are trained in higher education. This is extremely consequential for a society where in the West now only about 40% of the young people are white. How are we going to make that work? So I would add to that. Uh, um, so this is something that Gary and I sometimes have some debates about yeah. because this is kind of one of those glass half full, glass half empty mm. conversations. Just prior to the passage of the ban on affirmative action in California, I was writing quite a lot about the disastrous way in which affirmative action was in fact being employed, mm. that it was a very modest uh, intervention. And that it, it's terribly mm. important, but I, I think it's really important for people also to understand that it was modest. Mm -hmm. We were not getting huge numbers of people through affirmative action. And oftentimes people would go through the motions um, and then end up with the same result <laughs> that they had before. And that's true today. Um, you know, even, with, even in states with affirmative action, the relative access of students of color compared to white students and Asian students who are doing very well on average um, is declining in our selective colleges. It's not increasing. And part of that's because there's a lot of things besides discrimination that are blocking those students. Their families have far less resources, like one-tenth or one-fifteenth the average wealth of white families, for example. Um, and they have less connections. And they go to more segregated and weak high schools. There's all kinds of barriers in addition to discrimination. And affirmative action by itself, without other things, um, can't really produce anything like equal outcomes. It, but it produces a lot better outcomes than what we had before affirmative action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's important. It's, it's important that it's there. But I think you know, if, if we were to be really serious about this, mm -hmm. I think we would examine carefully how much more we could derive from affirmative action if we were to do it really, really well and seriously. And actually, I'm a little bit hopeful about that, because I do think that folks across the country are beginning to realize this is, this is having a real impact all around. And it is important that we have some diversity. Now, how that happens and, uh, you know, is another issue. So, so one of the, one of the uh, I mean, you mentioned yeah. uh, the s students of color tend to come from segregated schools. But wait, we don't have school segregation <laughs> in the United States. How did that happen? How well, did resegregation we devoted ourselves to desegregation in a brief period from the middle 60s to the early 1970s. And we concentrated most of our work on the South. Most people who lived out the sides of the South said, we don't have any problem. It's those, it's their problem. So in the middle 70s, we began to look at the history of cities outside the South and we, where mo the vast majority of minorities are concentrated in urban areas outside the South. 
Um, and we found that in every one that a court ever looked at, there were lots of um, parts of official discrimination that led to the segregation that existed, even though there was nothing in the state constitution that required it. Um, but by the middle of 1970s, the Supreme Court control had changed. The, fed the presidents, most of the presidents since that time have done nothing about the issues of segregation. Um, the, in beginning in the 1990s, the Supreme Court called for ending desegregation plans that already existed. And then early 2000s, they outlawed many forms of the voluntary desegregation, for example, in Seattle. Um, and so we're, we've been going backwards now ever since the 1990s. Every year, is, segregation has been increasing in almost every part of the country. So as you have an increasing population of students of color and almost no policy supports and some actual obstacles to taking positive actions, we've become more and more segregated. And it's almost never just segregation by race or ethnicity. It's double segregation by race or ethnicity, and sometimes triple segregation by race, um, poverty, and language. So and I will add to this that actually, I think unknown to a lot of folks, is the fact that this kind of segregation, not the same but similar, was going on in the Southwest with the Mexican population. Mm -hmm. Before Brown ever came about, in 1947 and 1948, there were cases in Arizona and in Texas, I, I'm sorry, in California and in Texas, state level cases uh, in which individuals were um, attempting to overturn the segregation of, uh, of Latino students. And, and somewhat successfully uh, were able to do so in pockets. But this never became a statewide issue, never became a, uh, a national issue. So that rightfully so, the focus was on the South and the apartheid that existed in the South. But at the same time, there was a, a failure to acknowledge and understand that a similar thing was happening, not the same again, but a similar thing was happening throughout the Southwest. And now today, we have a situation in which Latinos in the West are more segregated than African Americans, and they're soon going to be twice the population of African Americans, and the segregation is reoccurring in the South with Latinos. And it's interesting. In the Southwest, our statistics show that the typical black student is not in a segregated black school. They're in a predominantly Latino school, which means two different disadvantaged groups are combined. The Supreme Court recognized the right of Latinos to desegregation late, about almost two decades after Brown, but it was never enforced in any serious way. So we just let this isolation and inequality increase exponentially. And in California, for example, the, the chances that a Latino student will be in a highly competitive high school getting ready for college are like one in 14 compared to white students, something like that. So, so if the Supreme Court and other courts have been rolling back yes. these legal remedies or these legal responses, and the problems are as acute as you've described yes. them, what's the way forward? What can be done? Well, it's no accident the Supreme Court's rolling these back. We've had now 42 years in a row of the Supreme Court appointed by presidents who ran against civil rights a majority. We have five to four Supreme Court on all these big decisions. So whoever is elected president next time will have a chance to decide whether or not mm -hmm. that continues into the future. We could have a Supreme Court that would actually have a positive majority on civil rights um, in the relatively near future, which would really change the dynamics of this greatly. And there are many things that communities and states can do in this area. Um, but there's been very little leadership. I mean, people have been pretending that if we just test people more and more and test the teachers more and more, this will all become equal. And that's been a massive failure now after doing that for 30 years. So there are a couple of strategies that can be used. Mm -hmm. though. And one of the reasons why I point out sort of the economic imperative here is because I think you, if you can drive that home, to uh, states and communities, it can get people moving in a direction to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the things that Gary and I have looked at and, and are really wanting to research more is the whole issue of gentrification in urban centers around the country. Mm -hmm. In many ways, that has uh, come to be something that is um, less than desirable, pushing people out of their homes so that wealthier people can move into their communities. But if this were regulated and controlled, if this were thought about really carefully, about ways of holding the folks there while at the same time building up those communities and making them more desirable to middle class folks, we could integrate our urban centers. There's a great opportunity here that I think we believe is really being missed, that school districts and, uh, and city halls need to start talking to each other about what's in our our joint interests, what's, what's in the interest of everybody here in terms of thinking about housing planning and planning for gentrification. When my children were young in Washington, D.C., we organized uh, in a gentrifying neighborhood a, a integration drive where we recruited the newcomers into a public school that was virtually all poor and all black. And it's had a tremendous effect on that neighborhood, which included goes to this day when my grandchildren are going to the same school, which still is integrated, and has become a central institution in bringing people together in that gentrifying community, rather than just driving people out or separating them as ships in the night. You know, when Gary mentioned just a minute, I want to go back to something, mm -hmm. because I, there was a yeah. point I yes, wanted please. to make when, when he was saying how um, African Americans today are more likely to be in a segregated Latino school than mm -hmm. even in a, in a black school. In you the know, West in the West. You know, again, another really big missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. We're doing nothing about helping those groups to see their joint interests, about helping those groups. It's not that we want them to be segregated no. together, but to the extent that they are in the same places, we really need to do some intervention to have these young people come to understand each other better. One of the things that troubles me a lot is that a lot of the Latino population in certain areas of the country is immigrant. They don't know the history of the United States. They don't know the history of discrimination, of apartheid. They don't know this. And I think until we teach this in our schools to all of our students together, it's hard for them to appreciate the situation that people find themselves in. One and of I the things that's really sad is the Hollywood effect. We live close to Hollywood in Los Angeles. They have very powerful films that go everywhere in the world and create images of American society. But the ones that travel most are the more violent ones. Mm -hmm. And they have all these negative images of African Americans. And immigrants come to this country with that in their minds, yeah. a stereotype already implanted. Mm -hmm. And we need to work against that. We need for, for people to understand the heroic history of the black communities in the United States. And we need for African Americans to understand that mo many of the immigrants who are coming to our big cities are just like their grandparents when they came up from the South into a big city, struggling for a decent job and a decent chance. I know you work on dual language mm -hmm. programs and bilingual education. It seems to me this is one of the one of the areas of potential benefit from classrooms where there are Latino students and non-Latino students together. Say something about. So the research I know that you've done that's sort of this groundbreaking research about the benefits of dual language immersion, bilingual, bilingual programs, why is that a good thing? What have you learned about that? So nice of you to ask Paul. <laughs> <laughs> you ask your favorite question. <laughs> My pleasure. You know, uh, the way I like to enter into this conversation is the fact that immigrant kids and English learners, who by the way are not the same thing, mm -hmm. most English learners are not immigrants, mm -hmm. they come from immigrant homes, but they're, they're born and raised here. Today the estimates are about 93% of them are born and raised here, and they're our kids, they're our responsibility. But they get framed as by what they don't have rather than what they do have. They're framed as kids who need to learn English, who just, you know, have all of these needs Seldom do we talk about their assets, and there are many. But we'll just focus for the moment on the asset of, of language. It's, uh, we just published a book this last year called The Bilingual Advantage, and basically the point of that was to try and look at what the economic and labor force, mar mar labor market uh, advantages were for bilinguals. Because this may come as a surprise to you, but economists have been telling us for years that there is none. Mm. 
that uh, actually that, that bilinguals earn a little bit less than monolinguals in the same job. So we went after this issue. But the point here being that these, these young people bring a very important asset in a globalizing world. This is increasingly important to be able to speak another language, know another culture, which is the other piece of that, um, and be able to use that in the work that you're doing daily. And these, these young immigrants- I think Americans are about the only society that tries to do international business without speaking any other language. Right, <laughs> only in English and not understanding other people's cultures, and we know that where that gets us. <laughs> um, but in any case, these kids bring this to the classroom. It is possible to create these dual two-way programs that are really attractive both to the middle class English-speaking parent and to the, uh, the families of immigrants, bringing them together, desegregating them, creating a great opportunity to integrate these populations and providing a gift for everybody in the process. But it takes work and it takes teachers and we have to dedicate ourselves to doing it if we want to get these results. So we just have a, about a minute and a half left. Um, say a bit about how you're engaging students and faculty while you're here at the U of O. <laughs> well, I'm teaching a part of a seminar in the law school and really a central issue is uh, the conversation between law and social science over whether or not there are ways to solve racial problems without taking race into concern, into consideration. The central question that we have before the Supreme Court now in the new affirmative action case from Texas and we have with school desegregation and voting rights and so forth. Um, my position, of course, from my, in my own research is that there aren't such ways but a majority of the Supreme Court often thinks there are such ways. And there's a very interesting discussion going on between the majority and four member dissenters on the Supreme Court and all those issues. So that's one way we're engaging. I'm teaching a class in the College of Education and I have a really fascinating group of students there, for amazing students. So I'm gonna be learning from them while they're learning something about education policy from me. And I also have a number of young faculty members dotted around Oregon that I'm meeting with while I'm here. Um, these are young people that I worked with from California mm -hmm. who have now found their way here into Oregon. And so we'll, we'll hatch a few plots here. They didn't just visit, they stayed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're, you're giving this, say a tiny bit about the talk that you're giving tomorrow. You're doing a this, joint talk, I can't yeah, imagine how you do a joint Yeah, this talk is about the variety of ways in which access to higher education is diminishing just at the time that is most necessary. The way not just that affirmative action is challenged and forbidden in nine states now, but also the way in which our financing of public universities have been cut back, spaces have been cut back, universities are re recruiting students from other countries that can pay higher tuition, have educating less of their own students. The um, soaring tuition, the student loan crisis, a variety of things, all of which back in the 1960s, uh, Wayne Morrison, Lyndon Baines Johnson were working on solutions for and which we've kind of forgotten about in the more conservative era. So I'm, I'm sorry to say we're out of time. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for talking sorry. to me. Sorry. <laughs> thank, you, th thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, that was fun, Paul. Thank you. Those were good questions. You're welcome. And, and, and you're right. They were the kind of things we're so used to talking about. That, that's not. I've been speaking with the 2015 Wayne Morse Chair Gary Orfield and the Morse Center's 2015 Visiting Distinguished Researcher in Education, Patricia Gandara. Orfield and Gandara gave a lecture titled Diversity in Higher Education, Dangers of a Colorblind Society on October 6, 2015 as part of the Wayne Morse Center's 2015-17 theme, The Future of Public Education. Thanks for watching.